Hello, and welcome to the Hart House Literary and Library Committee's annual genre panel, A Deep Dive into Comedy. I'm joined today by comedians Leonard Chan, Rebecca Kohler, Sophie Cohn, and Daniel Woodrow, and our moderator, Robin Bacon. Thank you all for joining us. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land upon which Hart House and the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful for the opportunity to work and write on this land. I encourage all settlers watching to learn about the Indigenous peoples and literatures of our meeting place, especially since this panel is taking place in such a close proximity to Orange Shirt Day. Thank you for letting me begin. And now I'll pass the mic over to Robin, who will start the discussion. All right, Leonard, Daniel, Sophie, and Rebecca, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm just gonna dive right in and um, just ask a simple question, which is why did you become a comedian and what drew you towards comedy? And anyone can, can start. Uh, well, I can start, I would say I was, a, I was an environmental engineer before this. I spent 20 years doing that, and then I completely lost all faith in humanity, and so now I'm a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> cool, cool. I, uh, I, I think being a comedian was the first thing I actually tried when I like, first put myself out there, and I guess that ended up sticking, so I got lucky with that. What drew me towards comedy, I literally don't know. I don't think I ever saw a live show before I went. I just thought it would be something like cool to try and always made like stupid funny videos when I was a kid which is just like TikTok right now like I'd be viral for sure if I was a kid right now but <laughs> uh, yeah I think that's kind of how it started for me. Awesome. I think I um, I actually remember uh, the first joke I think I made um, to my brother and my father and they laughed and I remember being like, wow, like it felt amazing. And, and we also watched, we watched, we watched a lot of comedy movies. I was raised on Woody Allen movies. I'm sorry, um, <laughs> Chevy Chase. Like I just, we watched a lot of comedy, a second of uh, uh, SCTV. And, um, and then I remember as I grew up, I was like, oh, if I could make people laugh for a living, I would be crazy to not do that because it feels so good. And I knew that it didn't just feel good for me, but I, I figured it felt good for other people too. So, so yeah, once I figured I could do that, I was, I was like, I have to try that. And then I got addicted. Amazing. <laughs> Can I ask, what was the joke that you said to your uh, brother and your- uh, I don't know. Brother. I only remember that we were looking in the newspaper, trying to choose a movie, because that's how you used to choose <laughs> the movie you were gonna see. <laughs> And I remember looking at the newspaper and I remember we were at the dining room table, but I don't remember the joke. Oh, that's kind of awesome. Thank it was you. probably pretty bad. So I'm kind of glad <laughs> I did And Sophie? Uh, it was kind of an accident, actually. I, <laughs> I, uh, I went to school for journalism and I was going to be like a serious writer person. Um, and then around the time I was 25, I had one of those really adorable quarter life crises. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sort of on a whim, I took an improv class at Second City um, just because I was like, oh no, my life is <laughs> <laughs> crazy. And um, just completely fell in love with the community and the freedom and the, um, and the whole scene. And, and then from there, it evolved into stand up. And yeah, I was just kind of hooked after that. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you. All different, amazing answers. Uh, so, second question I'm going to pick is, um, what do you what does an average day look like for for a comedian like what do you what do you do all day <laughs> i mean there's no average day for me i don't think i don't think there's many average days um because every day is a little bit different it depends uh like right now is the most routine i've ever had because i'm writing for 22 minutes so now it's like oh i know like what i'm supposed to do every day but even today was wacky because like this morning i had to get up at 5 a.m to go shoot a scene for tall boys where I was playing an evil breakdancing condo developer. So <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah, and then I'd go back to work at 22 minutes and then now I'm doing this. So like, yeah, it's for me and anyways, I don't know how everybody else feels about this, but I don't think anybody, any day is like 
the same and uh, you just kind of take every day as it comes, which I think is a good way to handle a pandemic, I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. We have good training for a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyone um, else? But yeah, I would agree that no day is the same and it depends what you're doing at the time. Like if I'm just doing stand up, it might be like get up, maybe a bit late because I was out doing stand up late last night. Maybe go to the gym if I can't, you know, um, have <laughs> lunch, maybe have coffee with somebody and then kill time until my performance and then feel nervous for two hours and then do the show and then wait around for the second show. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but then if you're in a writer's room, you're just going to work like everybody else. Um, or then there's the life I'm living right now, which is that I've, I've had some contracts over the past few months, but there's a lot of days where I just wake up and I have to write my own script. So I spend three hours procrastinating and then hopefully end up sitting down to actually do some writing. So yeah, it's a real variety. <laughs> I mean, for me, I find that's hard to answer because like if you asked me that February or earlier, I would have a different answer than right now. Like, because life's a little bit more predictable at the moment, but um, yeah, I would say the same because I'm always like working on a lot of different stuff, like my own stuff running my own sh like a uh, monthly comedy show or like stand up and like uh, I've been doing some writer's room stuff in the last few months and like even like a small like role on, the, on Lady Dicks that they're filming right now. So it's like just literally every day in the last month has been completely different from days where I have nothing to do. I just go skateboarding or days where I'm sitting down in a Zoom seven hour Zoom meeting trying to like punch up a script. Awesome. Yeah, I would agree with all that. I have, I also have a lot of different lives. I feel like I have 94 different jobs all the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. my, uh, my main job, I write for CBC radio. So that's sort of my, my um, that's a fairly like stable part of my life. Um, and then I do some uh, humor writing on the side of that. So if I'm working on something a piece for publication. It usually involves, as Rebecca said, just putting it off, <laughs> yeah, yeah. cleaning my apartment, doing things that <laughs> are totally unrelated until the last possible second. Um, and then I also teach uh, satire writing at Second City. So sometimes I'm, I mean, right now I'm just teaching on Zoom, but uh, sometimes I'm doing that. And then before the pandemic, I ran a stand-up show at Comedy Bar, um, producing that and hosting that. That has not, obviously that's been on hiatus for a while, but um, yeah, so at night I would be prepping for that and like organizing the lineup and writing a set and doing all that kind of stuff. But now life is kind of weird, so I'm not. <laughs> not yeah. I know uh, stand up in the park is happening a lot. I've, I've seen a couple of those, which are fun. Kooky. <laughs> Kooky. Um, I guess it's kind of my own. Question. <laughs> Sorry? Pardon? The kooky alt right, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was going to ask, what, um, what kind of projects are you all working on now, and also, what is your favorite theater or festival to perform at, and why? Ooh. Kind of two and one question. I like whatever festival books me. <laughs> That's my favorite festival to perform on. <laughs> Whichever. <laughs> I don't have favorites. Theater, I don't know. I like, I hate all theaters. <laughs> I don't know. Like, they're really bad for comedy. They're really, it's like a different type of performance. So I feel like when the majority of the time you're performing in front of 50 to 100 people, and all of a sudden they're like, here's a thousand people, you're like, how? It's like a different but the laughs come to you like in a wave and it's all timed weird you have to there's longer pauses before people laugh so there's like a second where you think you're bombing mm -hmm. it's just like a completely different environment so yeah. i don't know like yeah, theaters aren't conversations they're just they're performances like you're basically would, here's my shit and then enjoy yeah. it there's no back and forth it just is what it is i would prefer like a packed 400 seat theater than like even like the bigger ones that I've done. I would probably agree with that. Um, my one thing that I like about a large audience is that there's more chance that 
people like if if 50 percent of a thousand people find you funny that's still 500 people so your odds are better but it is definitely a different kind of performance um my favorite club used to be the comedy works in montreal uh mostly because that's where i started and for years it was just like it was like a small club and it was with a brick wall even though it was a fake brick wall like it really felt like a comedy club um <laughs> But Montreal, anyway, I, I don't, I'm thinking about it right now. I'm like, I don't know if I could give it a favorite, um, but I definitely probably prefer club comedy over theater com comedy. Just there's, there's a different vibe. There's different pressures. I think I feel more at home in a comedy club. Um, and what was the first half of your question again? What am I working on? Yeah, sorry, I should, I should have spaced it out as two different questions, but. How dare yeah. you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will roll with the punches and answer. Um, I'm currently working on, um, I just finished a one week contract helping somebody develop a show for CBC. Um, and uh, before that I was working on something with John Doerr um, for a show he's doing with CBC and just for laughs. And then now I'm just writing my own scripts and you know, maybe hoping either they make a great writing sample or uh, I could sell them. But mostly I always just write something that I think will make a great sample. And then if it accidentally is sellable, then great. For sure, better to be safe. <clears throat> than yeah, and, and please, please share on what projects you're working on if you feel like it. If not, all good. You can ignore that part of my question. <laughs> um. I don't know. I like club shows, but I like theater money. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and the same thing uh, in terms of like my favorite festival. I mean, I guess I'll say Winnipeg because it's in a week. And then a week later, <laughs> I'll say something else. Uh, but uh, and then in terms of stuff I'm working on, I, uh, yeah, like right now I'm working with 22, but I also have a pilot that I have to write for CBC because it's part of the Creative Relief Fund. So... Um, yeah, so at some point I have to get around to that and then always my own stuff. Um, I started getting into kids television, which is so much fun. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. It's way more inventive. And again, like I said before, adults are useless. So, you, you know, it's time to try to get the kids, <laughs> try, try to get them uh, on board with saving the planet. Absolutely. Yeah. Everyone answer? I don't know if everyone answered. Uh, no, I know. So I, um... I, I'm, I do more uh, kind of humor writing than performing, especially right now. Um, but I would say my favorite place to perform is just the cab space at Comedy Bar where I do my show. It's just like such an awesome, like intimate space. I feel really at home there. I feel really comfortable. It's kind of where I launched the show. Um, I had a stand-up show where um, comics do a set and then they get analyzed by a therapist oh. on stage. Oh, I remember that show. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, awesome. and, and, yeah, and it just... Um, I don't know, it just always felt really like, um, I just, I really like the vibe there. Everyone, it's just like a really good uh, space. It's very, um, very warm and very, it's been a really good experience. Um, in terms of stuff I'm working on right now, like I said, I'm, I'm writing Q right now on CBC Radio 1. And um, I'm doing <laughs> a little bit of uh, humor writing on the side for a few different places. I'm working on a McSweeney's thing right now, Some randomly for Chatelaine, <laughs> which is, I, I realize, not a comedy vehicle. <laughs> but um, they've started to kind of implement more humor writing and a uh, few pieces for Reader's Digest and different places, so yeah. Awesome. Lots cool. Of yeah. Exciting, cool stuff. Um, uh, my next question is, how has the current social and political climate affected your comedy? And has it evolved? It's not my question, but. <laughs> reading it behind the computer I, mean, I will, oh go on go ahead no go ahead go ahead um i will say that uh yes uh i think that i have evolved and there are jokes that i'm pretty sure i was telling 10 or 15 years ago that if they did resurface i would <laughs> <laughs> some people to answer to you um and I hope that I would own it properly and apologize <laughs> properly um, if that is a possible thing to do, which I think it is. Um, 
But also it's funny, I was having a discussion with somebody recently about some guy I met on Bumble, to be honest. And he was, <laughs> although he only had one credit on IMDb and I was like, be your 50. Anyway, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he was like, oh, you know, it's not my job to save the world. And like, um, I just want to be honest in what I'm writing. And like, I could tell that a lot, his, his viewpoint was kind of, it, it was going against the grain of progression. And I think he thought that he was taking a stance. I think a lot of, um, I wanna make a blanket statement, but I'm finding a lot of men are, are finding the, or white men are finding that what's happening right now, some kind of like, they feel oppressed. They're like, I'm gonna go against the grain like they're Lenny Bruce, but really they're going against a really good grain. Like Lenny Bruce was going against the government and the man and like anyway Lenny Bruce wasn't perfect either but all this to say um I one thing I do feel imp is important to me is that I leave the world a better place than where I found it so like if you stay at somebody's house you tidy up when you leave and you leave a bottle of wine to say thank you and like whatever work I do I'm hoping that I'm leaving that bottle of wine in the apartment where I just stayed because um, I think to be lazy and be like grumpy about what's happening. I think if you can improve the world, like not that I'm on some kind of mission, but if you can improve the world through comedy, what fucking better thing is there? Part of my language. Absolutely. <laughs> Girl, men on Bumble, be warned. Um, yeah. cool. <laughs> one credit. Um, <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Rebecca. Anyone else? Yeah, no, I fully agree. I think it's it's good to leave the the world a better place. I tried as an environmental engineer, but these <laughs> fucking billionaires keep spilling oil, so that's not going well. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, with the climate the way it is, comedy relies on tension, right? You need tension to to so that you can then release it, and that's the laugh. And oof, so much tension to play with. You just got to be careful. Right, you just mm -hmm. gotta pick your targets correctly. And yeah, like to Rebecca's point, you know, like white men, there is a certain subsect of white men who is very angry about everything going on. And I think it's like for them, like a loss of privilege feels like oppression, I guess. I think yeah. when it's like, oh, what? I have to be like the rest of you that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Fucking bananas. But, um, but yeah, I feel like really um, it's just important to choose your targets wisely. Like punch up, Denver punch down. You know, uh, just always be aware of, of what the social dynamic is, what the power dynamic is. Uh, you know, if you want to tackle- Can we talk these... about, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Can we talk about Bill Burr's set on Saturday Night Live? I'd be curious oh. everybody's thoughts, but I'm not the moderator. <laughs> yeah, I haven't the monologue, so I'd be really curious to know your thoughts if anyone watched it. I, I tuned in the last 40 minutes, so I totally missed it. I don't know what he said. Yeah, well, I haven't so watched it yet. The other two haven't answered. I feel really bad, but you, you didn't see it, Daniel? No, I actually haven't watched it yet, no. Okay, all right, all right. Um, anyway, sorry, I interrupted. No, no, it's okay. I feel like I was like, oh, I should have watched it beforehand so we could talk about it. Um, um, yeah, anyone else want to answer, Sophie or Daniel? Yeah, I feel like um, I kind of swing wildly between like, just because the news right now is so grinding and exhausting and awful, like I swing sort of between creative paralysis where like I can't like, I often feel like I can't possibly write something that will capture like, the rage that I feel and like the enormity <laughs> of this moment. Um, and I kind of swing between that and then just like a total, it has a way of sort of when the world is like this crazy, like it has a way of kind of um, unleashing you and sort of making you not um, censor yourself and care as much and just sort of like going for it and writing jokes that are like older and braver and just bigger. And so um, it's a constant whiplash between like feeling like I can't write anything and then just feeling like, <laughs> I don't even care, like, fuck it all. Uh, so it's, it's one or the other, and there doesn't seem to be any in between on a daily basis. Okay, good. <laughs> hey, Sophie, I'm curious, like, has your curriculum for satire changed at all, given 2020? Yeah, yeah like, definitely. Like, how are you teaching it differently now? Sorry, I'm well, taking over. <laughs> no, it's, pretty, it's a good question. Um, I get a lot of um, students in my class in Second City who are, um, they're, nervous, I guess, about um, 
like like you were talking about punching up, punching down, that's become like a big point of discussion. Uh, we have a lot more discussions about like who it's okay to target in a joke, who it's not okay to target. Um, target. <laughs> no. um, <laughs> a lot of uh, questions around like, do I have the life experience to be making a joke like this? Am I the person to be to be making a joke like this? People are very conscious now about um, appropriating voice. Yeah, and appropriating people's, um, you know, it, like writing in a voice that's not your own and like how far can you take that and how far can you go with that? And when is that okay? Like there's a lot of nervousness I find and, and understandably. Um, so we have a lot more, um, we have a lot more of those types of discussions in class, but, um, I also like <laughs> in a weird class like not too long ago where um, somebody was upset that the, the sheer volume of jokes that are at the expense of white men right now and they're, <laughs> they're like, is, it, is it white men who's upset about it because I don't care <laughs> yeah it was, uh, it was kind of it sort of divided the class like so it was kind of an interesting, uh, interesting. yeah there was sort of like half the class that was like it's okay to offend white men with your jokes like they've been <laughs> they've had their time yeah everyone uh, loves it <laughs> yeah, and then the other half of the class was like, no, they're a group of people too. Like, so it was just like, there's a lot of those types of discussions. But um, yeah. Well, so that's interesting. And I think it's a worthy discussion because, yeah, I was upset I, I, when Bill Burr punched down on white women because he's a white man. Yeah. And I feel like that's not, I'll hear it from anybody else, but not from him. It really pissed me off. Yeah. But I, I feel like I can't say that it pissed me off because I'm a white woman yeah. and Twitter will just make fun of me. So um, yeah, it is really interesting, these dynamics yeah. of who can talk about what. It's, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and I would say broadly speaking, that is the biggest change in my classes is there's a real nervousness around who can talk about what. Like that's exactly yeah. it. Yeah, but that's good. I think it's good that people are thinking about it because before yeah. nobody was thinking about it and then that's how you don't have minority voices yeah, in exactly. yeah. the arts. <laughs> so it's, yeah. yeah, I'm glad that all this upheaval is happening mostly yeah, because too. it will help with my employment, but like. <laughs> yeah, and it's also been interesting too because in the last little while I have more um, minority voices in the classes. So I find people are less, um, maybe less willing or more conscious of, you know, when you're making a joke and it's just a, another group of like people who look exactly like you, you mm -hmm. don't actually have to look at anybody who's at the receiving end of that joke. It makes you kind of think twice. I think about like, who, who are you actually talking to? Yeah. And when they're looking back at you, that changes things a bit. And so I'm happy for that. That's good. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing conversations. Love it. Uh, <laughs> Daniel, did you want to say anything or? Uh, I've only really done about 15 or 20 sets in between <laughs> when all the protests yeah. and stuff started and now, but uh, I found it like kind of interesting because the majority of the audience that I've performed for are white, like between then and now. And I find that they were like very sensitive to any black jokes, also very sensitive to any jokes about white people and did not want to hear about COVID. So it leaves you a very small window to like relieve people while not touching on anything. But also I don't care and I'll still do the jokes anyways, because if you get pissed off, then maybe that's a you problem. Like I don't, like I don't really, I'll push the line, but I know that I don't cross it, so. So it is kind of a little bit frustrating where you're like, there's no, it's just like, resistance to everything because it's been so overwhelming and everyone's overstimulated so the first thing you want to hear when you hear comedy is none of those things that have been in the news non-stop for the last seven yeah years. yeah i saw that's i saw oh sorry go ahead well, I was gonna say, that's just thing with covid jokes right like people everybody's experiencing mm -hmm. it and everybody has but nobody it's like if you're being held hostage do you want to hear jokes about your hostage takers <laughs> And people are coming to like stop, like give it a break and like not think about COVID for an hour and just like let it go. Maybe like I find you can joke, like I'll do jokes about how much I've been on Zoom, like having Zoom parties and like like stuff like that, but never directly talked about COVID because I feel like nobody wants to hear that. And I don't really want to talk about it either. Yeah. That's the thing. I feel like it's going to be talked about maybe like 10 years from now when it's not too, too fresh and too mm -hmm. annoying to talk about. Well, awesome, amazing. Yeah, I know with um, 
because I would I would help out with um, the Second City camps and we were starting to teach the kids about consent on stage, which I think is really interesting in terms of improv, um, not so much uh, stand up because the kids don't <laughs> really know how to do stand up yet. Um, yes, and, but not always. <laughs> yeah, yes, and not, yeah, I mean, you got to do it quietly and you got to just like seek permission without like having to expressly talk about it and constantly check in with each other. Um, yeah. Awesome. Amazing. Um, that's another question. I don't know if we got any, we don't got any Facebook questions yet. Okay. I guess my next question would be, um, oh, do you have any advice for um, comedians just starting out in either in stand up or in improv? Maybe any writing tips or stage etiquette tips, whatever you got. So many. <laughs> um, I, I think my base advice well a like especially any kind of performance but especially stand up you just have to do it like just do it you can't not do it if you want to do it like I, i've talked to people who are like well i'm gonna take a class like okay fine but like get out like like anyway the only way to get good at these things is to just keep doing them and there's no way around that and that is a really frustrating aspect of it it's also one of the most exhausting aspects of um, choosing to do this kind of thing. You have to go out every night. You have to get on stage. You're tired. It's cold out, but like, that's what you have to do. But my second piece of advice is like, try not like, if you feel like you're doing well, like this is, I'm not speaking to people who are just like narcissistic egomaniacs. who are like, I'm amazing. But like, if you're like, I think I'm pretty good at this and people seem to laugh when I do it, don't get too many people in your ear about how you should do things. Cause I, when I started, I had a lot of people saying you, you have to do this and you should do that. And you should write like this and you should try to, and I had my own thing, but I got distracted by what other people were telling me. And like, I'm not saying not to take advice, but take it, process it and leave what you don't think fits for you because you know best what you're trying to do and how it works for you. Like for instance, other comics I know will write with other comics. I can't do that. As soon as I say a, a joke to another comic off stage and they go, um, yeah, I, that's <laughs> like, I'm never going to do that joke now. So just do it, just do it on stage. Um, so yeah, basically like my advice is don't take too much advice. I love that. <laughs> Especially from non <laughs> like comedians. Oh yeah, that especially. Like, yeah. like parents and family that come to see you. Like my mom loves to tell me what I should and shouldn't do on stage, like a pageant mom. <laughs> like set off. Yeah. Um, great, awesome advice. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I kind of like like similar to what Rebecca said. I like like I never when I first started I hated passing my jokes by other comedians. I would just like write it down and send it to like a close friend or something that knew like my voice and just be like, what do you think? And like. I find like they're a better judge than other comedians because when you ask a comedian, they're immediately like, how can I make this better? And it's like, mm -hmm. even though you're just literally, it was trying to like, see if they like it or not, like you weren't necessarily asking for help. So I find when you just ask a regular person, they'll be like, oh yeah, that's pretty funny. Or like, oh, it's okay. And like, just ask someone that you trust their opinion. Mm. It doesn't yeah. have to be a comedian. That's great. Thank that's you. my wife. She's like the canary in the coal mine, but it's so hard to get a laugh out of her. She's like, exactly. the all the miners are dead. And she's like, where's the fucking punchline? And I'm like, oh. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, Your uh, wife is roasting you. <laughs> oh, all the time. I've, I've bombed in front of my wife more times than anybody else on the face of the earth. <laughs> awesome. But, yeah, but I think it's like, yeah, I think like to say, to go back to what Rebecca was saying, you just have to do it. Uh, and you just have to not stop. And if you belong in the business, you will be in the business. That's pretty much it. Like I'll never stop anybody from quitting. Like if anybody decides to quit, that's never the wrong decision. So, you know, um, yeah. yeah and learn like how to take I notes. tried to quit and it hasn't worked. So yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's exactly mm -hmm. it. Like, um, but, uh, but also I think it's important to have like, friends in the, like sur like sur if you are serious about comedy surround yourself with people who are also serious about comedy mm -hmm. and who have like the same work ethic and who are willing to you know like they're taking it seriously otherwise you're going to end up like with just a bunch of people who just you know now you're just friends who 
you know, but you're not working towards a, a thing, you know, it's, you, yeah, it can hold you back if you are with the wrong crowd. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right on. I feel like this is kind of counterintuitive advice, <laughs> but um, uh, I think it's important also to cultivate um, other areas of your life so that you have things to write about and do comedy about. Because I, I keep running into this thing where like people are doing improv scenes about going to improv class or like people are doing like, <laughs> like people are doing like stand up like open mics about how they went to this other open mic. And it's like after a point, like you're sort of like, what are you actually trying to say with your comedy? And are you just so insular in the comedy world that like you don't actually have anything to say? And I think the only way to get around that is to like have a life that, you know, and read stuff and travel and like, no, like exist in the world mm-hmm. so that you have things that you care about so that you, you have things to bring to the stage or bring to the page or whatever. Um, because I think some comics get, like it becomes their entire life and their entire voice. And then they're sort of like, the only thing I really have to comment on in the world is like this very like inside baseball, like open mic that like <laughs> the average person has never heard of like, So yeah, I think that's important too. I think that's really true. And I also think that really helps with your mental health because it can be such a fucked up business and comedians can be so competitive. So you definitely want to be hanging out with civilians who just want to talk about like recipes. You get a break from this. Like, how did you get that show? How did you get that? Oh my God. I know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also like, that's where like the regular life is sort of I find where you can mine a lot of like weirdness and exactly make a lot of weird observations and like bring that back to your comedy like I just return to my class at Second City like one of the cool things about it is because it's sort of a beginner class for beginner satire writers they're all like they're all coming to it from like amazing amazingly diverse kind of backgrounds like there's a marriage therapist there's like a cardiologist there's like a business guy and it's just like, oh my God, like what, ama- like what an amazing collection of weird perspectives on the world. And like, that's only going to make your comedy better. Yeah, I agree. That's a really good point. Yeah, when a bunch of comedians hang out too long, their jokes just yeah. become jokes for comedians that yeah. don't make any sense. You know what I mean? You almost need that grounding mm-hmm. from regular friends. And also it's just really annoying hanging out with people and they're just trying to one up everything you say and everything's a yeah. joke. You know, like, I just want to chill. Like, I just want to hang out, have a couple of drinks, and chill. Like, yeah. we got to do this. Yeah, they're, like, always on, like, all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> You'll get those comedians who it's like, oh, you're 100% doing a bit on me right now, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You'll have a, the worst yeah. is, like, you have a conversation with the comedian, and literally, like, 10 minutes later, they're on stage yeah. saying the exact <laughs> thing they just said yeah, to and- you. I'm like, oh, fuck off. Yeah. And you're like, why didn't you just tell me you're doing a bit? And then it wouldn't have been awkward for five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> when they say something sad or serious, I'm like, is this a bit? Like, how do I react? How do I react to this? Um, Don't laugh if you never do it on stage. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, or ask you again. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask something and I totally forgot what it was. Oh, yeah. Um, what, uh, what are, who? Who or what are some of your influences? Um, They can be comedians or like films or like music that has inspired you or inspired your comedy, either recently or or something you saw for the first time and you were like, ah, like this is it for me, I guess. I've been asked this question like a hundred times and I always- Me too. Sorry. (laughs) And like, again, I'm sorry, Woody Allen is a huge influence on me. I watched all of his movies when I was a kid, which is also kind of weird because they're not really children's movies. Um, But that kind of like erotic, um, uh, uh, emotional kind of humor. I really like um, people dealing with emotional situations in an awkward way. Like to me, that's just, that's how I behave. So or maybe it's chicken or the egg. Maybe that's why I behave that way because of Woody Allen. Um, but, and then for stand up, like when I was starting, um, Janine Garofalo was uh, kind of hot at the moment. Sarah Silverman, um, Ellen DeGeneres, uh, Jim Gaffigan, David Cross, Mitch Hedberg. Um, and at the time, they were all considered alternative comedians. Uh, yeah. 
really so interesting. True. Now yeah. they're like, I think they're just main, considered mainstream. Um, but I think it was usually people who were trying to say something a bit smart through humor for the most part. Um, and yeah, I think I always like, I want, I want to laugh, but I also want something to chew on. Um, and I think those are most of the comedians I was usually drawn towards. Yeah. They leave you with an idea. Yeah. And also for me, it's a, there's a big element of like wanting to feel like I know the person after they get off stage. Uh, for me, I, I'm, I feel, I left, I'm left cold when somebody gets off stage and you can tell it was all just this kind of facade, which I think is less and less in today's comedy. But I just, if I can't emotionally connect to you, ugh, I'm really bored. Yeah, especially in stand-up, I feel like you need to reveal a little bit of who you are. Like in improv, you can kind of hide behind characters, which is so fun. Yeah. But stand-up is like, and part of the reason why I'm scared to do it, even though I want to do it, is because you have to kind of show a bit of yourself. And it's like, ugh, vulnerability grows. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Yeah, I hope that like early influences don't affect who you are as a person because the first comedy album I ever had was Bill Cosby. So I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, man, it, <laughs> yeah, it was brutal. I like my first album was Bill Cosby and uh, comedy album. And my first music album was Michael Jackson and I had a poster of him on my wall. And I was like, what the, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> you know how to pick it there, Leonard. <laughs> uh, it's, it's me, it's me. I, I made this happen. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Bill Cosby was great because he's such an incredible storyteller. And I actually got to see him uh, before all this stuff broke, so I had no idea. And then uh, it, was, it was incredible watching him just command an audience for two hours. just sitting, And he was in his 80s or I don't know how old he is now, but he was just, just sitting there in like sweatpants and a Nelson Mandela t-shirt and just <clears throat> talking for two hours and it was riveting. And it's just like, and then later when all that stuff broke loose, you're like, oh no, like he's using that power for evil. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, forgot to tell you, I'm a predator. Yeah. But, um, uh, but yeah. I really like like writer comedians, like just mm. cleverness, like people who could really use like the written word in a way that's like, ooh, I love that. Like Patton Oswalt or like Gary Goldman, John Mulaney. Mm -hmm. um, seriously, yeah. I love. Um, and a lot of writers really become performers pretty quickly, usually, I feel like they got that strong word yeah word. i mean i started as a writer and i'm still trying to figure out performance but I think, <laughs> <You're good. laughs> um, i'll get there one day but um <laughs> but yeah it's uh yeah that's what i gravitate towards just writers cool i would mm. say um in terms of stand-up um my probably two biggest influences have been maria bamford um who's just mm. so like awesomely weird <laughs> Um, and Tignataro, who I just find so funny and deadpan and like <laughs> ridiculous. Um, but I also feel like in terms of early influences, there was sort of a heyday of uh, women on Saturday Night Live in the 90s uh, and later on with like uh, people, like there was sort of a time when it was like Rachel Dratch and Tina Fey and Maya Rudolph and like Kristen Wiig later, like all those people. Um, and I think just seeing um, they're like they're also individually explosively hilarious and then seeing them together as this like collective of women um was so like it really um yeah i was really i was really uh affected by that i guess mm -hmm. it was a beautiful time on snl for sure yeah, it was a beautiful time <laughs> <laughs> and daniel uh, i guess when it comes to like influences it would be more about around the time when i first started because I guess once I started, I didn't try to watch, like I didn't watch too much of one comedian or another because I feel like I would just start to adapt that style because I didn't have my own style yet. And so like the most the majority of my influences after that would probably be like local comedians or Toronto comedians or like the bigger comedians that I had met when I first started. But I guess like the ones that kind of made me want to do comedy, Jim Gaffigan would definitely be a big one. Like I really liked and even can see how I have a similar delivery, but I really enjoy like his delivery and uh, just like how he didn't really try to seem cool. It seemed like around that time, like Dane Cook was trying to be like the coolest guy on earth and all these other comedians were trying to be cool. And Jim's just like, I like hot pockets. He doesn't like, he didn't care. You know what I mean? So yeah, I really enjoyed that. It's actually funny because I started long enough ago that I had a MySpace account before I did my first set. 
And he was like the only comedian I could think of. So I like went to his page and messaged him being like, hey, I'm thinking about starting comedy. Do you have any advice? He's, a, he's like a huge comedian at this time. And he actually like responded within that day with like a bunch of advice for me, which I think is super amazing. And I hopefully get to meet him again or like meet him at some point so I can like bring that up and thank him. But I thought that was amazing. What was his advice? I uh, I mean like now it's so long ago I could barely remember it and I cannot find my account like my MySpace account I cannot like log in or anymore to get the message but it was like basically I think it was just like go out like every night and like just try to be yourself like you know the basic stuff that sounds like um pretty generic but it is like the best advice like don't try to be another comedian or anything else like just mm. be yourself and like it's not easy <laughs> like but I think more just him responding made me like, oh, well, like, I, I got to try it now. <laughs> like, <you know>. <laughs> <laughs> I love that through my space. That is iconic. <laughs> yeah. um, that is we, have <laughs> uh, we have a question from Facebook um, from Kane Lamb. How do your best bits originate? Your best bits of comedy. Where do they come from? I can, I'll start if no one has anything. Uh, usually for me, it's literally, I don't know. I feel like a jokes develop in my brain without my knowledge. Like I'll see something, I'll notice something, I'll notice something. And then one day it just like almost pop, like the best jokes I have, I feel like it just pops in my head, like half written where you're like, there we go. I, all the bits are together now. The I have all the puzzle pieces, they just connected. Then you just, I, I kind of would just start writing from there. But a lot of times I feel like it's, pretty involuntary like I'm not good at sitting down with paper and being like all right what's funny today like I'm not that kind of writer it just doesn't doesn't work for me stand-up wise I'm very similar to Daniel they things kind of pop into my head or I'll notice something oh that seems funny and then the really good ones just kind of like mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it's kind of there and then I'll talk it out on stage I'm definitely exactly. more of a oral writer than a paper writer for stand-up specifically. Um, because stand-up is a conversational art or whatever you want to call it. So it only makes sense mm -hmm. that you would talk it out. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, I would say all of my favorite jokes, I don't even know where they came from. <laughs> and then there's a bunch of other stuff and it all is just like a, it's like a, uh your act just gathers moss like the more jokes you have the more tags you have and the more threads you have, and the tangents and the blah 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 and it all just kind of grows mm -hmm. yeah for me it used to be like i used to start a bit with like oh what do i think is funny but now i'm starting bits with like oh what do i believe and then i kind of come from that angle and so like one of the favorite bits i had that i was doing for the last couple of years um I put it on albums, now it's gone, it's dead. But it was, uh, it, it took me like a year and a half to figure out how to get this joke to work. Like I, I was like, I know this premise is, it should work. And, but it was a tough premise, it was, it was about mass murder. <laughs> and it was about like how I know Asians are catching up to white people because they treat our murderers the same as white murderers. So I was like, <laughs> well, I really like the observation. And, and I was like, I, like, I know that's fine. But then it just took some time to like, what do I, how do I deliver this? Like how, what is the package, the vehicle for this thought? And then it took like a year and a half for me to work that out into, into like something that was consistent, where it constantly work, where like I'm always, always getting an applause break at the end or whatever. And it's just, yeah, but it's not, but it's not always like that. That's probably like the, the joke I probably worked the hardest on to try to get to work. But other times it's same, same with Daniel, same with Rebecca. It's just like, oh, this joke just sprung from my head like Athena, like just hammered out just happens you never and I think part of it is like the more you write the more the more you've internalized uh the process for yeah. how to write jokes and so then everything just kind of assembles mm -hmm. in your head yeah it's kind of a mysterious process um but I find that maybe one consistent thing for me is like it's usually something that there's some um emotional heat behind so it's things that I'm really mad about it's things that I find really funny um, it's things that I'm like worked up about in some way. Um, that's often how it starts. And then it's just about the discipline of sitting down and like writing it and, you know, looking at it from a few different angles. I'm, I would say the opposite of Rebecca. I'm a very, um, 
I'm a writer before a performer, like, so I'm a very written person. Um, does that make sense? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so I need to sit down and work it out on paper and just sort of like, you know, I often don't know exactly where it's going until I've sort of written through it a little bit. But yeah, it usually starts with some kind of an emotional response to something, whether that's rage or hilarity or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Really yeah, I, f I find the same with me too. It's like something that really annoys me and aggravates me. It's like, I'm like, for example, like one of my favorite jokes to do, like my neighbor had dogs that would bark all constantly, like five pugs she would always let outside and they would just bark all day long. And it literally made me so mad. I was thinking about like, po literally poisoning them. Like I like, I'm not doing a bit right now. I'm telling you the truth. Like, I literally was like, how could I poison these dogs? And then I'm like, wait, hold up. You're going insane. Like, just write a joke about the dogs, mm -hmm. and then you'll feel a lot better. <laughs> like, because you, every time you, you release that frustration, kind of when you perform it, or you make it like, now it's not just your problem, it's everybody's problem. Like, they understand what you're going through. Yeah, definitely rage is a really big. <laughs> Save me from killing them. I like dogs, by the way. Just... Six months of them barking 24 7. Yeah. And we could do a lot of things. That's, that's me with my neighbor's kids. They won't. <laughs> See? <laughs> no, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't them too. Um, me and I that, yeah, like to Sophie and Daniel's point, I think like to find the emotion of a joke is super important. I forget who told me this, but like every joke like needs an emotional core mm -hmm. where it's like, because that's the way for the audience to connect with a joke. So like, even if, especially like, you know, if you're talking about very specific experiences, like there's gonna be stuff that the audience is not gonna be able to relate to mm -hmm. in terms of like the specific details. But if you can find an emotion that they have all felt, a universal emotion, then that is the entryway for the audience. And if we can emotionally connect to the joke, then that's how we know that's the way the audience is gonna connect to the joke, so. I feel like, the, sorry, I keep uh, talking, but I feel like the magic in, in like stand up two is when you find that moment that you thought you're the only one that experiences and the audience thought they were the only one. And then a bunch of people in the room at the same time realize like, yeah, that's exactly what happens to me. That is like the magic of a really good joke. I love those. And yeah, that's usually what happens when you, you're talking about something. That, that's where like, I find the relief comes from when you're like, okay, it happens to everyone. I, you feel a lot like better. Mm -hmm. Especially if something it's a little dark toned or, or has like a kind of a darker emotion to it for sure. Like we just did that now. We want to poison. Uh... <laughs> I don't. They're, they're gone now. There's no dogs to poison. Dogs are safe. Dogs are safe. Okay. Like, don't they're worry. Now. They're gone away from me. I'm just um, calling the, the authorities, but come on. <laughs> 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 Daniel dropping Hershey's kisses all over his neighbor's yard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. I'm trying to think of another question. Um, you covered a lot of stuff, which is which is great. Oh, maybe um, if you if you know a question about writer's block and how you maybe push through it or get through it. I find it's a little hard, especially when you don't want to write, and especially during this pandemic, it's kind of hard to be creative. If you have any advice on that. Just watch Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only half joking. I really feel like with writer's block, the best cure is to leave the writing. Not every time, but like, because when I'm stuck on something, the answer comes to me when I'm doing something I'm not supposed to be doing yeah. at that time. So like mm -hmm. watching Netflix, clipping my toenails, walking my dog, whatever, like, that's when you're like, oh, and I feel, I have weird feelings. Like sometimes you have a deadline. Sometimes you have to get something done. Sometimes you do have to sit at the computer, but I really feel like you have to be able to let go of some part of it so that it will come through because it is such, uh, it can get such a grip on you. And it just, you're like, what is my purpose in life? What, it can be such a dark writing by yourself is like, it could be like writing in a dungeon. Um, so yeah, but I would say walk away, but don't, don't just like pick your nose out, like walk away and hope, walk away, walk with, away a with intention. Yeah, walk away with intention, exactly, yeah. Awesome. yeah. Walk away with intention. 
Like, I feel like a lot of writer's block and stem from fear that whatever you're going to write isn't going to be good. But, you know, I feel like I've just accepted that whatever I write is not going to be good. Like, at least when at the beginning, like, it's just going to take time to get there. Mm -hmm. um, but like, it's just, I think, has anybody here read the book Bird by Bird? Or oh, I have it, but I haven't read it yet. Ah, great book. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of those, so Bird by Bird, um, it's a book by Anne Lamott, and then uh, Bird by Bird is a reference to her father who's trying to help her brother get through this huge school project about birds, and he's like, well, you just do it bird by bird. It's just one step at a time, right? So that's all it is. It's just discipline. It's just like, you know what, just put one foot in front of the other and just do it, break it down to the smallest pieces and then, and then work that out. And I think once you start, once you get that ball rolling, once you get that muscle going, you get that discipline, then it's a lot easier to keep it going. It's like working out, right? Like if you lose that fitness, then it takes time to get it back. But if, you, if you're there, then it's, you know, it's not as hard. So you just keep, keep writing. Just keep writing, never stop uh, until you die. <laughs> I find also sometimes it's helpful to read or watch something by someone you really admire. Mm. Um, and also, uh, sometimes this is a little narcissistic, but um, read or watch something of your own that went really well. Like, and remind yourself that like you, you wrote something that was awesome or you had a really good set or you, you know, whatever. Like, um, I find that can be helpful. Sometimes also I change the font. <laughs> that's a great i'm gonna try that's that. a good one that's a really good one because then it like i don't know it's weird but it appears to me as like a totally fresh piece of writing and then i'm like oh yeah. it's just it's just a weird little thing I do. that's a great idea i'm gonna for sure try that yeah try it calibri yeah calibri. Uh, i'm gonna write this joke in wingdings it's gonna be great point. <laughs> But also, I know Daniel hasn't answered yet, but I will say too, when you do walk away, like sometimes I'll have like something I have to write and you know, I get the assignment on Monday and then it's Thursday or Friday and I still haven't written anything, but that's not to say I haven't been thinking about it all week. And by the time I sit down, mm -hmm. it's there. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll feel guilty all week knowing that I haven't actually sat down, but it's not like it's not happening. And I feel like you have to learn when you're actually just shut off and when you're actually processing and percolating because you have to walk away to percolate. Um, so yeah, it's like finding like how you work and knowing when you're knowing when you're fucking the dog and knowing when you're actually doing something, but it looks like you're fucking the dog. Again, part of my language. <laughs> I feel like a lot of dog stuff going dogs, on this country. Dogs are really getting it this, uh, this time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Poor dogs. <laughs> I, I also love how there's a dog right behind your head. The... I mean, <laughs> oh yeah, sure. Brody. I, um, yeah, I feel like I'm either in a constant state of writing block or like, I feel like I'll have a month where I can write really well anything I want between stand up the scripts I'm working on, whatever. So I'll just like literally write as much as humanly possible. And then I just seem like I get tired or something, I hit a wall. Uh, when I'm working on scripts, I find I'm either more on or off. If I work on it every day, I'm more on. But there's days where I'm like, I can't write today. But as I'm walking around, it's still like, what, like you said, percolating is the best way. Like, I feel like it's yeah. brewing in my head. All of a sudden you get like that puzzle piece snaps and you're like, there we go. And now you can go back yeah. to writing. Yeah. I don't think that like writer's block necessarily means you're physically writing or typing like it would be when you're out of ideas but sometimes I feel like you just need a break like maybe I'm not the most practiced writer that's why I need to get into more routine but I honestly don't like I wouldn't be able to write every single day every day I mean when there's a timeline it does help because you have that pressure that keeps you motivated but I find when I just don't give myself a pressured timeline, I come up with a better result in the end. Well, I think the walking away is important because then it promotes lateral thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like I think what a lot of, I used to be on the board of directors of this company called Subtle Technologies and the whole purpose of the company was to create spaces for inter interdisciplinary thinking, like between scientists, oh, artists and whatnot. Because like oftentimes, especially with science, like you get so, uh, you know, you have the blinders on and you yeah. only know how to do things a certain way and your depth 
you have a lot of depth of knowledge, but not a lot of breadth of knowledge. And then oftentimes the solution is coming, is from an entirely different field. So we get these people together, they talk, we talk about their problems and all of a sudden somebody be like, hey, you know what? We kind of have a thing that we had to, you know, like some, like a pottery person will figure out how to solve like some sort of chemistry problem. It's just, yeah. It's, yeah. Just lateral yeah. thinking is really important. Love that depth and breadth of knowledge. It's quotable. Love it. Amazing. Um, I guess probably more logistical question is, is what kind of advice would you have for someone just like getting into the industry, whether that has to do with like representation as a writer, or as a performer, kind of what, what advice or, or good tips would you have for someone trying to navigate the industry? I think it's different for like, like for stand up, it's just go and do it. <laughs> and yeah, you don't really have a good, yeah, just, go and do it. yeah, just keep doing it. And same thing, you know what? It's actually the same for all of it. Just do it and then get good at it. Don't worry too much about like, if you're just starting, like you shouldn't be worrying about representation. <laughs> you should be worrying about getting good, you know, and, and, and honing sure. your craft and sure. figuring out who you are and your perspective, you know? Because all comedy to me is like craft and perspective, right? And perspective is who you are, it's what you want to say, what you see the world, and then craft is how you communicate, how you see the world to an audience in a way that's entertaining. So then that's something that you can put work into. So I think it's just work at it. Just put work into it. Mm. Don't worry about any of the other business stuff until you get, there'll, there'll be a point when you will, but that's not like for, oh, it won't be for a while. Like two weeks at least. <laughs> at least two weeks. And then, and then, you, and then in, in a month after that, you need to hire a money manager to handle all of the money coming in. Yeah. No, I, I, I fully agree with that. Um, but then I would say once it is time to get representation or whatever, I would say for me and like, look, I'm like a very, um, I wasn't cut out for this business. Like I, I, I am, I think comedically and in certain terms of talent, but I am like a nice person who doesn't like to be pushy and doesn't like confrontation and doesn't like to ask for things. And that's been a really hard part of the business for me. Um, and I, I think I wish I knew that I had to be kind of more of my own cheerleader. Like even if you have an agent, you're still your best agent. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember that and you have to stand up for yourself. And I have a lot of shame even when I talk to my agent, you know, like, um, is it okay if we ask for a bit more? Like I should be like, I want more money. Like there's, <laughs> you know, so I just think you have to believe in yourself. If you want to bother, like there's a reason you're here. There's a reason you're doing well if you're still here and you have to believe in that and you have to be there for yourself. Like it sounds so corny, but I think I wish that that's definitely something I wish I was better at or if somebody had like maybe coached me on that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a weird business and it's, it can be really hard, but it can be really fun. Um, but to Leonard's point, first and foremost, you got to get good at it or like get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Better get out. <laughs> Love that. Thank you. Yeah, I would add to that that there's a real, um, just in the current moment, we live in a real focus on like building a personal brand and how you market yourself. And like people are very concerned with like how they appear to the world uh, rather than what they're actually putting out and what they're actually creating. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's kind of backwards because like, like I've, I've been in meetings with agents uh, when I was looking for representation um, about writing different things. And they're like, well, how many Twitter followers do you have? And like all this kind of thing. Yeah. And it's sort of like, I don't know, maybe I'm just like old school, <laughs> but I do feel like what Leonard's saying that like the craft and the getting good at what you're doing has to come first. Like that has to come first. And then when you're undeniably good at what you're doing, then you can start to worry about how you market your brand or whatever crap. <laughs> um, it's true yeah. though, I agree that we're in kind of a weird vortex where it, it does feel like talent and output has taken a backseat to yeah. social media. And I really hope we're out of it soon. Like I went to a stand-up comedy show at the Improv in LA and it was all like YouTube and Instagram stars. Yeah. And it was yeah. not funny. And I was like, if I had come to that comedy show is the first comedy show I'd ever seen in my life. I would never go to another comedy show. It was sold out, I bet. <laughs> it was sold out though, because they're all famous, but they suck. So like have another yeah. show somewhere else called like the shitty performer show at the <laughs> shitty performer 
club. Like, <laughs> don't call this comedy. How many clubs do that just purely to fill the rooms? And it's super annoying. I know, but it's it's a real bummer. And I think to Sophie's point, like th that's kind of like again, like I hope there's a backlash to it because there's nothing wrong. And because I feel really old, I'm like, well, I don't have that many followers. Maybe that's I'm bitter, but I'm also a good comic. So I'm I am resentful that somebody with ten thousand followers who isn't funny is getting a spot and not me so that's a that's definitely a weird part of the business too is, yeah and i find I, I have a hard time caring about that stuff like twitter uh i'm on it it doesn't matter to me at all i don't really like it just <laughs> i don't care i can't bring myself to care about these things in the way that i guess i'm supposed to so maybe that's a bad answer but <laughs> i'm the same so at least we're in it together I'm, I'm with you guys too i have like no twitter followers and i'll give a shit <laughs> And I know I'm supposed to, like, I know, like, if I want to, I know a lot of writer's rooms, like, they would look at your Twitter account yeah. and be like, oh, what is, and I'm like, yeah. I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't care. Yeah, I'm old. It's not, it's in my 40s. I didn't have the internet until I was in university. Why the fuck? <laughs> yeah. 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 Awesome. Thank you. Eh, fuck social media. Sorry, I don't know if I can swear. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, do you guys have any questions for each other? I mean, I'm kind of, I think I asked a whole bunch. We covered a lot of stuff. If you have personal questions, creative questions, professional, I'll let you do it. Whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, if you've been gossip from LA, some hot goss. There's COVID there. Tell everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it is crazy though did you know when you're when you fly back there they don't ask you you don't have to quarantine they don't ask where you've been or if you've been exposed to the coronavirus they don't that it's, is well that um, explains a lot <laughs> exactly no i mean if i did have a question for people it would probably largely be about social media and we kind of just covered it and um i just like to hear other people say that they don't focus too much on it because it's it's like a major I'm always like I should be trying to tweet mm -hmm. I should be trying to tweet but I'm also trying to write a script and do this and like Twitter doesn't feel like the best place for me to put my energy and yet it, maybe it is but mm -hmm. it depends on what you want you know yeah. like I think now after I think now after you've become a really good comedian now if you wanted to kind of hone the social media aspect of it and then drive, use that to drive people to your shows and then they'll actually be good shows. That's a whole different scenario than, right. you know, that shitty, like exactly thing you talked about. Like I was in JFL like two years ago and I'm, I don't know if you guys remember that variety top 10 nonsense. Yes. Was, oh yeah. Uh, was it Southern Mama or whatever his name is? Yeah. And I was at that show and holy shit, <laughs> that was so bad. Um, yeah, and it's just like, and like his his career as a, I mean for that is done like yeah. he still got YouTube shit but like and and but that's getting increasingly difficult to monetize so it's like but what do you really want I think yeah. what, what yeah. I want to, like what do you yeah. want to do and then that will determine whether or not you know you should money. Money. I kind of sit on the fence with this because I agree like it's very annoying when like somehow how many followers you have gets you booked on a show or not booked because especially in the States, they have exposure to millions of more people, so they can easily gain followers through shows. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we're in a weird time where we started before social media was popular. If we started now, people would watch us grow our whole entire career and you would have dedicated fans by the time you're at the level yeah. that Rebecca is at. And it's like, then you would have that amass of followers, but because we never, we're working on other stuff. but. Um, and then on the other side, the way I see it is like, even if you just casually tweeting one tweet per day, like, you know, even just doing that, I've gotten like gigs. I, I barely tweet, by the way, I've only started pretty much since the last lockdown, just because like I would only promote my shows before. And then like, you can get gigs from that pretty easily. Like a lot of people go and check that right away when they are thinking about booking you or check yeah. your social media. So it's like not it's like almost like the way you would check someone's linkedin when you when you're like on a business side just to see you just maybe go to their instagram not to see their followers but 
if I'm like thinking of booking someone, someone recommends to me, I'll go see if they have any stand-up videos on there or like, like what their content's like. Funny things once a day or just something? Oh, on Twitter, I feel like I try to just tweet one thing a day and I found the less you try on Twitter, the better. I mean, I'm not very good at Twitter, but literally when I, the ones that do well, the ones that just a throwaway post and you put your phone to the side, you know, think about it and then you check and you're like, oh, like, so I, I'm more post on Instagram and Facebook because I like, feel like Facebook is all the people you know and the people that support you that you've amassed through your life. And then like Instagram is kind of like a showcase a little bit. So I feel like you can benefit, you can't lose by just trying a little bit, dabbling a bit. Maybe it'll get you a couple extra gigs or something, but it's like art is, comes first. Of course. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And I certainly don't begrudge anyone. Some people just took to Twitter. Some people are like, this is so good at this it. This is yeah. how my mind works and this is perfect for me. And I, you know, I just wasn't like that. So I certainly don't judge anyone who's on Twitter, but yeah, I don't want to beat myself up for not being good at it. But you're right. Like I can just I'll just throw a tweet out. I'm gonna start doing it. I'm gonna yeah. do it. I'll let you know what it's happened. Like you can throw out your premises too or something or like, you know, when you're working on a little joke, you can kind of throw it out there as a feeler since we can't do stand up. And then, I don't know, sometimes it's just like, it's sort of fun after a while because you're just like ranting about something, you find something annoying, you just throw it on there. It's like, it takes a couple seconds. I don't know, it's, it's sort of fun, but it's also very pointless, <laughs> so. I'm gonna post rejected copy jokes. I think that's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a great idea. That would probably do great, honestly. I feel like the people that do the best on Twitter are just like some regular, like 21 year old that works a regular job. Like they always are the funniest. Yeah. That's true. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, it's really nice to, because I, I have a couple of friends who went viral and I'm like, oh, but they're not as funny as me. And then it becomes like this weird thing, you know, like, yeah. oh, I'm not. And I feel like, oh, this joke is actually has some potential. Should I save it for my, you know, my script or my, my stand up or my improv, whatever? Mm -hmm. It's kind of nice to hear um, fancy comedians like you all like have a similar idea about it to uh, to myself. It makes me feel good about myself as an up and coming comedian. Um, I think we're gonna end it soon. I'm waiting for someone to kind of close the thing. You're welcome to keep talking until <laughs> I'm like waiting for. I'm just the moderator. Um, but yeah, how yeah, was your the moderator go? Well, I'm I'm the moderator, but the, oh, yeah, the people right. yeah 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 I'm here. I'm like, um, <laughs> but I'm waiting for the people who are running the event to kind of. Yeah, I, I I'm here. I'm just waiting in the wings. <laughs> oh hi Matthew. <laughs> Let's just ask Matthew questions. Oh no! Oh no! This is I'm not very good at being interrogated, unfortunately. <laughs> it's not an interrogation. It's an interview. It's different. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let me just get my. Closing remarks already. <clears throat> Thank you, Leonard, Rebecca, Sophie, and Daniel, once again for joining us today. Your discussion was so insightful and interesting. And thank you, Robin, for helping to moderate the panel. That'll be all, but if you enjoyed this video, then please join us on November 24th for our staple fall event, How to Get Published. And stay tuned for our monthly Deconstruct the Library activities, which includes a social justice reading list and hip hop playlist. This month, the theme is future. You can find more information about these events and the Hart House Literary and Library Committee on hhlittonlib.ca or by following the committee on social media and subscribing to our monthly newsletter. Please also listen to our EndNote podcast, which is released bi-weekly everywhere you stream podcasts. Thanks and goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Great Bye. to see you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 B